de -dute. <laughs> that was my creative technology for the day. I have exhausted all of my creative juices right here. Oops. Right here in one fell swoop. <laughs> I got this brilliant idea from Melissa at uh, Free Range Psychic, except she does it with technology. I'm all old school. <laughs> so welcome to our Saturday book and... I'm sure now you all know what we're doing, but here's the book, Weird Scenes, Inside the Canyon, I can't read backwards, by David McGowan, and perhaps you've all read this, and maybe the premise of this book is familiar to everybody. I read it a few years ago when it first came out. It was published in 2014. When it came out, I had never heard any of this stuff. And as a matter of fact, although a lot of these tunes are familiar, I wasn't an avid consumer of rock and roll. Sad story, my father only allowed us to watch two, listen to two kinds of music, classical and Irish. <laughs> and anything else we listened to was illicit so of course you know I heard it through my friends and when he wasn't around but uh, it wasn't media were not as accessible then as they are now I mean you had to have a radio and you had to be allowed to play it so I kind of grew up in an authoritarian environment and my younger siblings uh, you know the pressure was a bit off and they're more familiar with this so I wasn't uh, I was an adult until I really became familiar with this, and my husband was a musician in another incarnation. Uh, he became a medical lab, a clinical lab technician, so <laughs> it wasn't a very successful musical career. But for a while there, you know, we had a band, they traveled around, it was fun, they got it out of their system. And he's really, see this collection back here, like I said earlier, previous video, my son-in-law can hardly wait for us to die, so he gets to inherit these. Uh, it's, it's quite the collection of, of 60s vinyl. Uh, most of them I know nothing about, sad but true. But what drew me to this book, and why I picked it for today, is it has, well, actually peripherally it does, but when I started out theoretically, it has nothing to do with politics, and it has something to do with the occult to a certain extent and mind control and I thought it was perfect for Halloween time you know we're rapidly approaching that and I just wanted to give everybody a break from Washington DC backfired a little tiny bit because all roads lead to Washington but th there's a lot in this and it's just fascinating now caveat he does lean towards the conspiratorial a bit. The first time I read it, I fully bought it. Somehow or other, I've managed to rise above the conspiracy theory mind control. I now see places in the book where he draws conclusions that they're a bit of a stretch. I'll point them out if I remember. I skipped some of the conclusions he drew that I just really wasn't buying. So, the premise of this book is just fascinating. It's uh, based on the notion that the United States, here we go, the government, the United States government for decades and decades has used popular culture as a way to control the population. And, for example, FDR's fireside chats, that's an overt example. Um, John Kennedy was really good at it. He was a very uh, compelling speaker. He was charming and he drew people in. He really was a genius at it and he had good speech writers. Reagan always leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I abhor him. Uh, Reagan uh, did a lot of manipulating in that way too, but I hate to put the word Reagan and good, those two words together in the same sentence. Uh, he was adept at it, but it was nefarious. And this has been going on in popular culture from the beginning. I even, you know, yellow journalism, newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. So 
With this particular book, his premise is that rather than a spontaneous uh, birth of a counterculture and youth movement that evolved out of uh, some kind of awakening from a, a opposition to the Vietnam War, the burgeoning opposition to the Vietnam War spurred the government on into using mind control techniques they had already pretty much perfected to denigrate the peace movement by making uh, uh, an undeniable association in people's minds, in the public's minds, that the peace movement and dirty hippies, drug addicts, and people living on the streets of Haight-Ashbury were one and the same which was the farthest thing from the truth. Denise and I talked about that just a tiny bit the other day. The peace movement really began at uh, the very beginnings of the 60s and it began on college campuses and it was driven by academics and uh, graduate students. The Students for a Democratic Society was an egghead organization in white button down short sleeved shirts and crew cuts and horn rim glasses. This was a very um, conventional group of people who were pacifists and did not like what they saw happening because they were aware of history and politics. It was completely co-opted, according to this book, by a manufactured counterculture that sprang up of, out of whole cloth in Laurel Canyon in uh, starting about 64-65 and this book goes through all the connections that he that lead him to believe that this premise is true now is it true or is this another example of the human mind seeking patterns i think a little of both i think there's some truth to it a lot of the things he talks about are undeniable fact and he makes that point at the beginning of the book that everything that he talks about is available for public consumption. He didn't have to make any FOIA requests. Uh, he just presents what's already out there in the ether. And people in the mainstream neglect to draw these conclusions. He thinks that's on purpose. So let's just go ahead and start the book. It's very interesting and I really enjoyed it. Uh, a real trip down memory lane even for somebody uh, such as I, who was kind of a, a, an academic secluded nerd in a girl's school who had very little to do with most of this, I desperately wanted to go, for example, to the, the war mor moratorium. Uh, and uh, our principal held a, you know, an assembly and said anybody who is caught leaving campus and going to the moratorium will be expelled. Ha! Well, ha, put an end to that. That's how far my dedication to peace went. <laughs> so let's begin with the book, Weird Scenes Inside the Ca uh, Canyon by David McGowan, published in 2014. Okay, so he says that he's been called a conspiracy theorist. He embraces it. He says it's a pejorative, and I, tr I believe that's quite true, that uh, just because it's um, a conspiracy comes from the Latin, it means to breathe together. The Boy Scouts are a conspiracy. The American government is a conspiracy. Well, it really is. Uh, PTA is a conspiracy. Any organization, any, any group of two or more people who gather together with a common cause, breathe together, are a conspiracy. And if, it's only a theory if it's not true. <laughs> so, or if it hasn't been proven. So he embraces it. And he says that all his research was from mainstream sources. Uh, he says the truth is out there. You just have to seek it out and uh, draw the associations. He says he has put commonly ignored facts together and he's often at odds with the um the mainline widely accepted consensus reality he has no agenda he says he's just seeking unspoken truth he has no political affiliations he's never been associated with any government or um quasi-government entity 
uh, has not was not born into a military family, not associated ever in his life with any intelligence group, and has no inside connections whatsoever. He said there's no fact in anything in this book, no fact that's con controverted, that is controversial. They they're all known facts, ignored, neglected, hidden, but not uh, made up. He said they're mined from the mainstream, but they're stripped of the usual spin. He had no access to any of the people in the book, any of these famous people that we're going to talk about, any of the experts. Uh, everything is cited um, with the source and uh, many, many quotes in this book, but he didn't, didn't contact any of them be, because he says uh, access comes with the price of journalistic integrity, that uh, they will only say what what they really want you to know, that he, he is aware from previous experience in dealing with these people, that this is the story and they're sticking to it. Um, he said that it serves no publicist for the estate of a famous musician to speak out in this way. And he says often, Haight Ashbery, you know, is, is really familiar, but he said there was a much larger and more counterculture scene in the Hollywood Hills in a place called Laurel Canyon. And this, this is between um, LA and the San Fernando Valley and Malibu. And uh, it's preceded and largely, in, it, it did precede and largely inspire the parallel scene that e evolved in San Francisco. But Laurel Canyon came first and it was the impetus. Uh, why is it so lesser known? And what are all the dark secrets? Well, he claims that this book shines a light on that. So chapter one, Village of the Damned, uh, by way of an introduction. And his, uh, each chapter has a quotation, many of them from music or from famous people speaking about it. And when appropriate, when it, I thought it was interesting enough, I, I will uh, repeat it. So this chapter, the beginning of the book starts with, there's something happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear. So the first week of August, we're going to go back in time to August, 1964. Uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. U.S. warship, the USS Maddox, was under the command of U.S. Navy Admiral George Stephen Morrison uh, and allegedly came under attack patrolling the Tonkin Gulf off the coast. Um, this led to a congressional investigation and the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which was an escalation of the war in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, which ended with uh, more than 50,000 American GIs dead and millions of civilians dead. It was not a false flag. A false flag is when uh, the Lusitania, for example, when something bad is allowed to happen. Uh, many believe Pearl Harbor was a false flag. Many believe 9-11 was a false flag. And that's all debatable. That's not, I now I'm afraid to say anything. Not my opinion, I'm repeating the narrative. And the belief is that uh, a false flag um, creates, it stirs up a public reaction, and that reaction leads to government action or legislation that the government actually wanted and could not get the people interested in to begin with. So the Tonkin Gulf uh, incident was not a false flag. Uh, the U.S. didn't attack itself and blame somebody else. It didn't allow an attack to happen and not prevent it. And, and it wasn't an attack that was uh, intentionally provoked. It never took place at all. Nothing actually happened. And this has been proven. This is, uh, it, it took decades, but it has been proven. And the whole story was spun from whole cloth. And according to Google, uh, Legitimate concerns regarding uh, the veracity of it uh, exist out there now in uh, official documentation, historical documentation. These ships were an, on an intelligence mission and they were being provocative on purpose, but North Vietnam didn't react. They were hoping, they didn't react. 
And when that didn't work, they just, the Americans just claimed that the, the North Vietnamese did react and made the accusations. And that led to the resolution that read, led to the escalation of the ground war and the rest is history. By February of 1965, without a declaration of war of any kind, the United States began bombing North Vietnam. And they engaged in what became known as Operation Rolling Thunder. So three and a half years, they dropped a million tons, a million, more than a million tons of bombs, rockets, missiles, incendiary devices, and chemical warfare agents on a civilian population. It was one of the largest humanitarian crimes of history. In February of 1965, the uh, first official U.S. soldiers hit the ground. Now, there were American military in Vietnam before that, often ununiformed. Special forces were there for more than five, four years before that, after the French left, as advisors. By April of 65, so two months later, there were 25,000 U.S. Uh, young people in Vietnam. And by the end of 65, there were more than 200,000. Meanwhile, what was going on back home? So you've got this war escalating. The anti-war movement is really genning up. So Laurel Canyon is a heavily wooded, rustic, secluded area. It really is beautiful. In the hills between the LA Basin and the San Fernando Valley. And all of a sudden, literally, I mean literally overnight, Musicians, songwriters, singers all began congregating as though summoned by the Pied Piper. <laughs> uh, and it was the overnight, seemingly overnight, creation of the hippie flower child movement and a completely new style of music. From the mid-60s to the end of the 70s, there were a, an incredible number of rock musicians who, uh, superstars, who emerged from Laurel Canyon. The very, very first were the birds. David Crosby, Mr. Tambourine Man, which was released on the summer solstice in 1965. One thing he does in this book that I, I thought was fascinating the first time I read it, and now I thought, well, you know, you can make a lot of inferences like this that mean nothing. Uh, he likes to point out whenever something happens on a significant occult date. Although I will say it's kind of astounding. Um, he makes a lot of snarky comments about it happened on this date. What a big shock. I left the what a big shock part out. But if you're interested, uh, you can research these dates. And it is astounding how many things happen during the occult season of death, which I believe is from uh, the end of March to the beginning of May. And a very significant number of absolutely horrifying historical events have happened in in that time period like statistically way more than uh the odds would allow uh the beginning and ending of the civil war the beginning of uh american involvement with the lusitania in world war one um oklahoma city bomber uh, columbine and uh does that mean that that all of these things are intentionally done on those dates or is it about the energy, the astrological energy. I'm just asking. So the birds suddenly appeared and they were quickly followed by the mamas and the papas, frontman John Phillips, um, in January of 66 with If You Can Believe Your Eyes and Ears. And a guy called Arthur Lee, who had a band that started out, I think they were called the Minas, We'll get to it. I have it written down. But it became the band Love in May of 66. Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention in June of 66 came out with Freak Out. Buffalo Springfield with Stephen Sills and Neil Young came out in October of 66 with their Buffalo Springfield album. The Doors, Jim Morrison, came out in January of 67. And one of the earliest there was Jim Morrison, uh, the most iconic, controversial, critically acclaimed, and influential, called himself the Lizard King, and also, coincidentally, the son of Admiral George Stephen Morrison, who was in charge of the Tonkin Gulf incident. So, the father, who was conspiring to fabricate an incident to accelerate an illegal war, 
was uh, the father to the son who was positioned as the icon of the hippie anti-war crowd. And we're going to learn things about these people that are going to shatter. I mean, it was shattering for me. Shatter your uh, assumptions about them. Your idols might have feet of clay. It is truly astounding. So then came in uh, Laurel Canyon, Frank Zappa, who was considered the father figure in this group. He was highly influential, highly influential, especially behind the scenes. He was never as commercially successful. He had his following, but never as successful commercially, but so influential with these other groups. He lived in a place called the Log Cabin, which we'll get to, which was in the heart of Laurel Canyon at the crossroads of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Lookout Mountain Avenue. He was the host to every musician in the canyon, many of whom lived in his house. He discovered or signed many, many of Laurel Canyon-based music labels. Uh, many of them were bizarre and obscure, and I've spent the whole week looking these people up on YouTube listening to their music, and it's just been a trip. For example, Captain Beefheart or Larry Wildman Fisher. Some, some went on to stardom, for example, Alice Cooper, who was the uh, psychedelic rock come shock rocker. Uh, Frank Zappa was responsible for giving him his start. The log cabin was run like a commune. It wasn't really a log cabin. That was just the cute name for it. Uh, it had numerous guest rooms, a guest house. It ha was on acres of land. It in had inhabited caves and tunnels and uh, connections underground throughout the whole area. Uh, it was a cavernous five level room with a 2000 plus square foot living room that had three chandeliers. It had a massive floor to ceiling fireplace. Zappa introduced and pushed the look and the attitude that defined the hippie counterculture. However, Zappa called them freaks, didn't start out calling them hippies, and he made no secret of his complete contempt for the hippie culture that he helped to create. And he didn't start to have contempt after what they became. He had contempt when they began. Zappa, now here we go. This just did me in. I love Frank Zappa, but not anymore. Zappa was pro-military, rigidly authoritarian. He was a control freak. He felt no connection no kinship with the youth movement that he helped to nurture. And his father would have reviled it. He was very close to his father. Now, all of these uh, statements that I'm making um, are, are fact and can be looked up on the internet. And I'm not gonna give you citations for them. There's, they're in the back of the book. They're, on, they're available on the internet. And many, many of these um, comments about the personalities of these various people are based on numerous interviews that were done uh, throughout the years from people who lived with them, bands they helped form, producers, directors, music record label owners, you know, all these people who knew them in many, many different incarnations of their life in music. So Zappa's father was Francis Zappa, and he was a chemical warfare specialist assigned to the Edgewood Arsenal near Baltimore, Maryland. This is the longtime home of U.S. chemical warfare programs, and it's deeply involved in the MK Ultra mind control operations. And I know that we're going down a conspiratorial rabbit hole, but this has all been proven to be true. It's controversial, and there are people who still deny it, but there are far more people, and since the Freedom of Information Act, finally these documents are coming out. And MK Ultra was a real thing. And they really did uh, try to come up with mind control, propaganda, brainwashing, with, with and without the use of drugs. Uh, Timothy Leary was involved in it. Uh, they used LSD. They had that First Earth Battalion. Um, all true. Frank Zappa lived his first seven years on military housing on the grounds of the Edgewood Arsenal. 
His family later moved to Edwards Air Force Base near Lancaster, California. His dad continued to work for the military industrial complex throughout his life, but the son became an, uh, an icon of peace and love crowd. Zappa's manager, Herbert Cohen, uh, and his brother Mutt came from the Bronx and they, came, they arrived right before the explosion of the musical stuff in Laurel Canyon. He was a former Marine who traveled the world before coming to Laurel Canyon. In 1961, he was in the Congo. He um, was peripheral to the torture and killing of the leftist Prime Minister Patrice Lumbumba by the CIA. Cohen was there to supply arms to Lumbumba in defiance of the CIA is the story. Frank Zappa's wife, Gail, whose real name is Adelaide Slotman, was from a long line of career Navy officers, including her father who worked in classified nuclear weapons research. Gail was a secretary in the Office of Naval Research and Development and claimed to have heard voices all of her life. She attended Naval Kindergarten on the base with Mr. Mojo Risen, Jim Morrison. So let me go back over that very quickly. Frank Zappa, father in chemical warfare, raised the first part of his life at the Edgewood Arsenal, chemical arsenal. His wife, Gail, and Jim Morrison both spent their earliest years, formative years, with their military intelligence fathers um, on military bases and went to kindergarten together. Jim Morrison went to high school with John Phillips and Cass Elliott. Papa John Phillips. This guy's a piece of work. He was instrumental in helping to spread the youth counterculture movement across America. He was the first, he was the co-organizer of the Monterey Pop Festival, which really brought all of this to the forefront. Um, it was an unprecedented media exposure of music and fashion for hippies. It was televised. And in fact, on Turner Classic Movies, it's going to be shown this week or next week. I, I occasionally go through a few weeks of upcoming films to see if there's something fabulous that I haven't seen or haven't seen in a while because I really love old movies. And lo and behold, guess what they're showing? The, the film, the documentary of the Monterey Pops. Uh, he wrote, San Francisco, be sure to wear flowers in your hair. And it helped to lure the disenfranchised, most, mostly underage runaways from all over the country to San Francisco and Haight-Ashbury in 1967 in what became the Summer of Love, which was really the summer of homeless, uh, traumatized teenagers living on the streets and being drugged out of their minds. John Edward Andrew Phillips opened the doors of his home to the famous and the infamous, like Charlie Manson and Roman Polanski. Uh, the Manson family also stayed at Zappa's house, uh, the log cabin, and at the Laurel Canyon home of Mama Cass Elliot. All these people were very close associates. Cass Elliot's house was right across the street from the Laurel Canyon home of Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski, two of the Tate murder victims. John Phillips was the son of World War I U.S. Marine Corps Captain Claude Andrew Phillips and a mother who, she must have been crazy, claimed to be psychic <laughs> and had telekinetic powers. This book is rather dismissive of all things um, paranormal. It's interesting. So I had to... <laughs> I had to sort of tiptoe around some things. So yeah, uh, John Phillips' mother was a psychic. Uh, he attended a series of elite military prep schools in Washington, D.C. The book makes a point of drawing connections between all of the people who uh, had connections either in school together, on military bases together, families in uh, military intelligence who also lived some of the time or a lot of their time growing up in um, the area around the CIA and military intelligence in Alexandria, Virginia. And um, what was the other thing that they like to point out? Oh, the number of them, a number of these rock stars who went to military prep school is astounding. So 
John Phillips attended an elite military prep school in Washington, D.C., and he had an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. He dropped out in the first year. After he left Annapolis, he married a woman named Susie Adams. Susie Adams was a direct descendant of John Adams, you know, the president. Her father was involved in cloak and dagger stuff is how she described it. He was in covert intelligence operations um, in the Air Force in Vienna. Susie got a job at the Pentagon and she worked with John Phillips' sister, Rosie. His uh, mom also worked for the federal government, but her job is not allowed to be disclosed. His brother was a former Marine and a cop, and as a cop, he faced a disciplinary record for violence against African Americans. Before Laurel Canyon, Phillips was in Havana, right before he came to Laurel Canyon. He was in Havana during the Cuban Revolution as a concerned private citizen who went to fight for Castro. During the Missile Crisis, he was living uh, right next to the uh, Mayport Naval Station, and they do make the suggestion this is one of the times when I'm thinking, okay, we're drawing inferences that may not necessarily be true. Lots of people live close to there and we're not involved in military intelligence, but boy, these coincidences are piling up. Stephen Sills, a founding member of two Laurel Canyon bands, founding member of Buffalo Springfield and then uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, um, wrote the song For What It's Worth, which was considered the anthem of the era. Uh, he, his second single, Bluebird, interestingly enough, shares the code name with the CIA's MKUltra program. He's from a career military family. He was raised all over, started out in Texas, but as a child, went with his father, who was in military intelligence and in CIA, to El Salvador, Costa Rica, and the Panama Canal Zone, and other parts of Central America, as his father worked with the military to spread democracy. He was educated on military bases and in elite military academies. Everyone in Laurel Canyon said that Stephen Stills had an abrasive authoritarian personality. He claimed he spent time in the Vietnam jungle, but he was never drafted, so nobody could understand what that was referring to. He wouldn't talk about it. Um, naysayers claimed that before Laurel Canyon, there was no military in Vietnam, you know, before the Tonkin Gulf. However, there were military in Vietnam. They were CIA and special forces, and they were there for years as before the ground troops escalated, so he very well could have been involved in that. Now, I'm going to stop here. Already we've done over half an hour. I'd like to give you guys a little break. This is part two. I don't think I've said anything too inflammatory yet. I hope this is as interesting for you as this was for me. I just couldn't believe it. We'll continue and uh, try to do a little... Um, uh, suspension of disbelief I think is necessary for this book but then you start to think oh <laughs> that's an awful lot of coincidences so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop I'm gonna upload this and I'll be back in a few minutes so uh it's launch